morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like also to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present new data from our product called QBeta G10. I would like to start with a short introduction why we think immune stimulation is needed in a disease which manifests itself with an excess of uh, allergic inflammation and with an excess of immunity against harmless substances uh, like pollen or house dust mites or other allergens. Uh, atopic diseases, as they are also called, have grown dramatically in the last 100 years. If you go back to the records of the Swiss Army, for example, and see what fraction of young recruits did report symptoms uh, of allergies or asthma in the year 1900, you will see that it's actually less than 1% of the young people had these diseases 100 years ago. Today, the number is above 20%. Uh, if you go to China today, you will find that in rural areas, less than 1% of the population has allergies or asthma, whereas in urban areas today, it's about 7%. So these uh, observations have been summarized under the umbrella of the so-called hygiene hypothesis, which basically says that as soon as a society develops, goes through industrialization and develops high standards of hygiene, you will see an immediate increase in the prevalence of allergies and asthma. And there was actually a long debate about what or why is this uh, correlation. And there are two uh, camps. One camp said there might be a positive toxic factor in our environment today which predisposes or which causes allergies and the other camp said there may be something missing in our uh, clean environment today. And I think the latter camp has uh, gained a lot of ammunition with a number of studies which were published about 10 years ago, which showed a strong inverse correlation between allergies and asthma and uh, chronic bacterial infections. One example are studies which showed that mycobacterial infections, which usually cause uh, tuberculosis, are strongly uh, inversely correlated to allergies and asthma. If somebody is a carrier of mycobacteria, he has a 16 times lower risk of developing allergy or asthma. And 100 years ago, everybody was actually a carrier of mycobacteria on this planet, which didn't necessarily mean that he or she would get tuberculosis, but the prevalence of these chronic infections has come down to about 30% today. And out of these observations, the idea came up that today something may be missing in our organism which keeps the balance between what is called the Th2 part of the immune system, which causes allergies and asthma, and the Th1 arm of the immune system, which uh, actually is there to fight bacteria and viruses that this balance came out of control. And if you consider that 100 years is not a long time in, from an evolutionary point of view, you can understand that if we get rid of these chronic infections from one generation to the next, we may just be left with an immune system which was simply not made for such a clean world. And today something is missing. And what we propose is that we give back to the organism an immune stimulation which he, it had when these chronic infections were the norm and which are missing today. And to do so, we actually use also nanotechnology, although I have to admit, usually I don't refer to this as nanotechnology because what we use is a so-called virus-like particle. It's the capsid of a bacteriophage, which is a virus which naturally infects bacteria, which we can produce in E. coli bacterial culture in high quantities. And this capsid protein, which has about 150 amino acid, acids, has the nice property that it self-assembles out of 180 subunits to form a spherical particle with a diameter of 25 nanometers. In the inside of this particle, we package a, an immuno, immunostimulatory DNA sequence, which is there to activate toll-like receptor 9. Now, let me say a few words about the toll-like receptors. There is a part of the immune system which is called the innate immune system, which means that everybody is born with a set of receptors which recognize the presence of foreign substances in the body. And the toll-like receptors, which are actually an ancient class of molecules, 
are there to recognize, for example, cell wall components from bacteria. This is toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 7 recognizes double-stranded RNA, which is also not normally in our body. It's only there when we are infected with viruses. And toll-like receptor 9 recognizes uh, unmesylated CG motifs as they exist only in bacterial DNA. In human DNA, CG motifs are methylated as a result of our transcriptional uh, control machinery. However, in bacteria, this machinery does not exist. And our immune system has evolved to have a, a receptor which recognizes when bacterial DNA is in our body, which results obviously from, from an infection. <coughs> <coughs> and this interaction between the bacterial DNA and toll-like receptor 9 essentially prepares the immune system to a counterattack. And only from there on does the specific immunity kick in where antibodies are produced against the bacterium, where cytotoxic T cells are produced, etc., etc. So our approach with uh, QBeta G10 is to stimulate the innate immune system and it's known that TLR9 activation is a strong bias towards the TH1 arm of the immune system. We could demonstrate in preclinical experiments that there is a potent uh, activation uh, of TH1 cytokines, uh, interferons, uh, interleukin uh, 1 and 12, for example. Now, why do we have to package this 30 base pair long oligonucleotide into a virus-like particle. Other people have tried TLR9 agonists in a different format. Uh, what they did is that they have modified the chemical structure of that DNA because if you would just inject the DNA in a naked format, what would happen is that it would be immediately degraded by DNases in the serum of the patient. So what they've done is that they have modified the backbone by sulfur residues so that the DNA actually turned out to be a phosphothioid <laughs> DNA and they've tried such drugs in clinical trials and actually did not find a statistically significant effect either in allergies or in asthma. The packaging into this virus-like particle has two major effects for us. The first one is that we can prevent degradation of the DNA in serum and the other one is that by the size of the particle, which is 25 nanometers, we can target our payload in the particle to the site where it's needed. And the site where this immune stimulation has to occur is in the lymph nodes of the patients because this is where the immune system basically takes place. Now, when we inject these particles subcutaneously, we could demonstrate that these VLPs are very efficiently transported through the lymph system into the adjacent lymph nodes. Importantly, there is a size limitation in this lymphoid transport of about 100 to 200 nanometers. These uh, uh, tubes uh, out of which the lymph system is built up are very narrow and there are small valves even in it which block anything larger than about 100 to 200 nanometers of being efficiently transported. So when we inject these particles, what happens is that four hours later we find the material in the, in the adjacent lymph nodes and there the particles are taken up by antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells and other cells. And only within the endosome of these cells will the protein shell be degraded and the toll-like receptor 9 agonist, the DNA, is released where it can interact with toll-like receptor 9. Now importantly in humans, TLR9 is expressed endosomally and not on the cell surface. This is why you need a transport vehicle to get it actually into the endosome of these cells. Once it has arrived there, these TLR9 agonists have been shown by the research community to interact at various levels of an allergic reaction. Allergic reactions are typically uh, divided in two, or in one early immediate phase reaction and a delayed phase reaction. It has been shown in a number of publications that TLR9 ligands show actually a down-regulation of IgE antibodies. We found the same in our, with our product in preclinical models. They <clears throat> interact with mast cell degranulation, which then causes uh, the release of histamine, which is basically felt by the patient when he's exposed to an allergen. On the other hand, these TLR9 ligands have been shown 
to interact with Th2 cells, um, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, which are Th2 cytokines, are downregulated by TLR9 ligands. And what all has also been shown is that eosinophil recruitment and activation are blocked by TLR9 ligands. We believe that the strong effect of our drug that you will see on the next slide comes from the fact that TLR9 ligands interact, sorry, interact at various levels in this cascade, not at a single, sorry, mm -hmm. not at a single level, but at multiple levels, maybe in a weak uh, and, uh, form. Now, the study which I would like to present to you has been conducted uh, in five study centers in Germany. Uh, we have recruited 63 patients who suffered from persistent allergic asthma, which required a long-term treatment with inhaled corticosteroids. In fact, on average, these patients have been on an inhaled ICS therapy for about 15 years. The concept of the study was such that we converted these patients in an initial phase to a standardized corticosteroid, which was beclometasone, and the patients were given either a high or a low dose of the uh, corticosteroid uh, so that their asthma was efficiently controlled. Then after four weeks of treatment with Qbeta G10 or placebo, the ICS dose was reduced to 50% and after a further four weeks it was reduced to 0%. The purpose of that was to induce symptoms of disease in a controlled manner and also to induce uh, markers of asthmatic inflammation. And for the study, we had five endpoints, um, three clinical endpoints. The first one were daytime and nighttime asthma symptoms that were recorded in electronic diaries. The second one was objective lung function measured by spirometry, where patients have to exhale air into an apartus, which measures how much air gets out of the lung within the first second. This is why it's called FEV1. And the third endpoint, which was the most important one, was asthma control as determined by a validated questionnaire. And this questionnaire is used broadly in clinical practice, and it is used to determine whether somebody is adequately treated or, or whether there is uh, a change in treatment necessary. And then we had two inflammatory markers, nitric oxide in exhaled air and eosinophils in peripheral blood. I would like to show you results now on all these five endpoints of the study after going quickly through uh, some more technicalities of the study, like the baseline characteristics of the study population. What is important here is the lower part of that table, which shows you what type of patients we had actually included in the study. Two-thirds of our patients were, uh, character had, were uh, characterized as being mild persistent, and one-third of, of the patients was moderate persistent in accordance to the GINA criteria of the year 2007. In essence, this means that this is more or less a standard asthma population as you would find it uh, in the street uh, today.